We're now getting more content in on a regular basis. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to the Bazooka. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at 10 OSCE stations in one clinical course. In this episode, this is a revamped edition of season three. So we shall be looking at surgery today. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. And remember, you may pause the video at any time and at any point to scream the answer at your screen or write them down on a piece of paper before I give you the answer. Beginning with our station one. Look at the picture and identify the structures one, two, three, five, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and fourteen. If it was up to me, honestly, I would have just said identify all the labeled things on the diagram. So this is a purely an anatomy question, very important, especially when you're discussing obstructive jaundice or hepatobiliary pathologies. That's why it's very, very important to actually look out for this. It's With surgery, you need to have a very good understanding of your anatomy. So you need to have a, a revision of your anatomy and brushing up on your anatomy. As we do more of the surgical topics, then you shall see what I am going to be talking about on the channel. So here comes the answer. So we'll begin, of course, to have our orientation. So this structure that you see over here, this is of course the liver, okay? So the, the liver can be divided into two anatomical lobes, pretty much your right lobe and your left lobe. And of course, this is the diaphragm that is separating the chest from the abdomen. Then here you have your pancreas. This is the duodenum, of course, as well as part of the jejunum here. So like I say, this is the right lobe. This is the left lobe. So beginning with our part one here, so I won't list them in order. So let me just explain what is happening, then we can go over them in order. So this duct here that's coming from the right lobe, this is known as the right hepatic duct. This duct here that is coming from the left lobe, this is known as the left hepatic duct. When these fuse, they're going to form what is known as the common hepatic duct. Over here, this greenish structure here is what is known as the gallbladder. This gives off a cystic artery, the, I mean the cystic duct, not artery, cystic duct. Now the cystic duct is pretty much going to merge with the common hepatic duct to give you what is known as the common bowel duct. Then the common bowel duct as well as the main pancreatic duct are pretty much going to be draining at what is known as the hepat hepatopancreatic ampulla. Yes, the major duodenal ampulla. You also have sometimes an accessory pancreatic duct which drains the contents of the hepatobiliary system into the duodenum. So I hope that gives you a perspective. So now, part one here is going to be your right hepatic duct. Part two here is your cystic duct. This is part three, core bladder. Part four is the duodenum. Part five is the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Part six here is the falciform ligament which divides the right and the left lobes of the liver. Then part seven is, wait, seven. Seven here is the left lobe of the liver. Part eight here is the left hepatic duct. Part nine is the common hepatic duct. Part 10 is the common bowel duct. Part 11 is the accessory pancreatic duct. Part 12 is the tail of the pancreas. Part 13 is the body of the pancreas. Part 14 is the main pancreatic duct or the pancreatic duct. Part 15 is the head of the pancreas and part 16 is the jejunum. Of course, you can just extrapolate and pick the ones that are relevant for the question. Moving on to station two, a 40-year-old Caucasian is brought to accident in emergency department with upper air obstruction. The following procedure was done. Mention the surgical procedure done. Mention four indications for performing the above procedure. The tube got blocked and the SpO2 reduced to 80%. What type of of hypoxia is this. Mention two other types of hypoxia that you know. Of course, this is going to be heavily reliant on your basic 
principles, your basic pharmacology, your basic physiology, of we will, which we will allude to when the time comes on the channel as we make the content exhaustful on the channel. So here comes the answer. So the fact that this was done in an emergency setting is why I actually went for an emergency cricothyroidotomy. Others would say maybe, possibly, what about a tracheostomy? Remember that the tracheostomy also can be done, but it takes a bit longer. It's much more difficult to perform. And so in the emergency setup, you would be actually much safer or much quicker to do a cricothyroidotomy, which is what was, I, I suppose, was done in this case. So indications are going to be including air obstruction, which could be due to oropharyngeal edema, just like in the case of anaphylaxis, foreign body obstruction. It could be also due to trauma causing oral, pharyngeal, or nasal hemorrhage that can also lead to air obstruction, upper airway stenosis or congenital deformities, tumors, cancers that are, of course, causing mass effect. Now, this type of hypoxia is hypoxic hypoxia, and the other types are going to be hypemic hypoxia, stagnant hypoxia, and histotoxic hypoxia. You can just have a read up on these. It's, it's very interesting physiology to actually have a read up of the details of this. I won't go into details much of this because it's more of a surgical aspect, a surgical rotation. Station three, oh my goodness, I've already given you the answer. So a 15 year old boy was involved in a road traffic accident and presented to accident and emergency department with right hip pain. The picture shown beside is his x-ray. What view was taken of the x-ray and what other views would you have loved to get? So of course this is an anterior posterior view and the other view that I would love to get is of course a lateral hip x-ray. This is very important because sometimes when you're assessing an intracapsular fracture you may not actually see it on the anterior posterior in an AP view of the x-ray but you may only see it on the lateral view of the x-ray. Now your diagnosis here is a left-sided fracture of the neck of the femur now, I want you to actually comment in the section below about what a garden classification actually this is, whether it's class 1, class 2, class 3, or class 4. I want to comment. I want your input as to what you think this type of a fracture is. Now, the classification that we use predominantly is going to be based on whether there is some displacement or there isn't some displacement, and this is what it looks like. So here you have your grade 1, which is incomplete fracture with minimal displacement. Grade 2 is a complete fracture with, of course, not no displacement. Then grade 3 is a complete fracture, which is partially displaced. Then grade 4 is a complete fracture, which is, of course, completely or displaced. Now, this one has a risk of avascular necrosis of the head of the femur. Then one of the feared complications, of course, is a vascular necrosis. Mention the three vessels that supply the the blood to the affected part. So you have the medial circumflex femoral artery, you have the lateral circumflex uh, femoral artery. These are of course branches of the deep or the profonda uh, femoral artery. Then of course you also have the lateral cervical ascending artery. Let me just show you a picture of how this is actually coming. So you have this, the deep or the profonda femoral artery, which is of course going to be giving off two branches. You have your medial circumflex like that and you have your lateral circumflex. Now your lateral circumflex is pretty much going to be giving off certain branches. There is, of course, a descending branch, there is a transverse branch, and there is an ascending branch. Then, of course, you also have other branches that are going to be arising, your retinacular arteries, the superior, the anterior, or posterior, as well as the inferior branches over there. And that this is how they look like supplying this particular area. Now moving on to station four. A 36-year-old rugby player presents to the accident and emergency department with headache, vomiting, and lucid interval after head collusion. A CT scan is done and the image is shown. So this is the image. What two important findings are shown on the CT scan? What anatomical point is the anterior branch of the middle meningeal artery likely to be injured? Which, which pupil might be dilated and why? What are the two indications for CT scan in this patient? What constitutes Cushion's reflex? So like I said, these questions are not going to be in the ultimate bazooka, so I'm bringing new content to the channel and uh, I've gone to actually bring you the grade A type of content that you deserve. So tell a friend to subscribe. That's the least you could do. So here comes the answer. 
So this, of course, this is a, a biconvex lesion. Okay, so this is most likely an epidural hematoma. So it's a biconvex, hyperdense lesion. So it looks brighter than the brain tissue. So it's a hyperdense. So this is an acute bleed. And of course, there is some mass effect that we can see, compression of the ipsilateral ventricle. We can also see that these structures in the midline have shifted to the opposite side. So shift of the midline structures. Now, the point where the middle meningeal artery usually gets torn is the point where you have the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the temporal bone, and the sphenoid bone meeting. You call this point as the terion. If you have never heard of the terion in your life, today is the first time you've heard of it. So this is known as the terion, where these bones meet. That's the point which is most susceptible. Then, of course, you're going to be having the pupil being dilated on the same side, so on the right eye. This is because of increase in intracranial pressure. There may be herniation, most likely with the epidural hematomas, you may have an oncoherniation or a trans uh, tentorial herniation. I'll show you the different types of herniations and I'll also do a lecture on the herniations later on. And this is causing compression of the third, third cranial nerve on the same side. And of course, indications why we can actually do a CT scan are going to be your presence of your lucid interval and of course the history of the head trauma with the symptoms, your headaches and the vomiting. Then the cushion's reflex is going to consist of a widened pulse pressure, which is, of course, increase in systolic and decrease in systolic. Then, of course, a bradycardia as well as irregular respirations. That's what is going to be consisting of your cushion's reflex. These are the different types of herniations. So you have your oncoherniation, which is, of course, your transtentorial herniation. You may have a central type of herniation. You may have a cingulate, which is also referred to as a sub scene. So this is the Fox cerebri then you may have a subfocin. You may sometimes even it having an upward type of herniation, uh, as we can see here, which is also another transtentorial type of herniation. Sometimes it can be a tonsillar herniation. Now, the tonsillar ones are, are very, very important because they can actually compress on the vital centers and they can actually lead to a patient dying because of the arrest of the vital functions. Station five, what complication is this? Eponym for the fracture, name used in classifying this fracture, eponym for this fracture, and the eponym for this fracture. So these are just spot things. The surgery is more about seeing and actually knowing what it is. That's why I never really enjoyed learning it much because it's just to do with pure memory, just memorization of most of these terms and memorization of most of these classification systems. So there's not much thinking that is actually required. So here is the answer. So this is, of course, non-union, which is one of the complications of fractures. These bones have not yet healed, have not yet united. Then there isn't any callus that has even began to form here. This here is what is known as a montagia fracture, where you have a fracture of the shaft of the ulna with displacement that's going to be, these, these are fracture displacements. There are two important fracture displacements that you really need to remember. Montageous fractures and Galeazzi fracture. So B is a Montageous fracture. How do I know this? Just remember Monte Auna. So Monte Auna, meaning that the Montageous fracture, the Auna bone gets fractured. Then the Galeazzi fracture is going to be the radius. So remember Gale radius. So the, this is a Galeazzi fracture on part E. This one here is a Coley's fracture, as you can see the fracture is over here. This is a Coley's fracture. Then this classification system that is used is the Weber's classification. Now moving on to station six. A 45-year-old patient with a three-month history of right upper hypochondrial pain. Current examination of the sclera is as shown in the picture. What relevant questions should you ask to qualify to a surgical ward? Mention any four investigations that you might do. Of late, she complains that it's hard for her to see, especially in the night. What could be the cause? So take your time, pause the video if you may, and here comes the answer. So this woman most likely has surgical jaundice. So the questions that you would ask that would qualify for surgical jaundice, of course, they've already told you that she's had a deep, deep jaundice. As you can see, it's pretty much deep, deep jaundice. So they often have pills too. The reason why they have pale stew is because the absence of stercobilinogen in the stew. The stew is also tends to be fatty and foul smelling. It's very difficult to flush. This is because you have 
absence of bile, which is an emulsif emulsificant. I don't know if that's a word. In bile participates in emulsification of fat, which is pretty much a process, a physical process that enhances digestion of fat and absorption of fat. So fat is not really absorbed. So that's why it's fatty and foul smelling. The urine is dark because of the conjugated bilirubin. Then, of course, the bowel stores deposit in the skin and they cause itching of the skin, which is pruritus. Then you may have a, a or plus or minus, you should ask if there's a, a fever or not, because this could be an infectious process. Then investigations include an abdominal ultrasound, five prime nucleotides. These are, these are enzymes that you can check for in the blood. Serum bilirubin, you may check for CA19-9, stroke nine, which is uh, seen in, in especially tumors in the head of the pancreas. You may also get serum aspartate transaminase, alanine transaminase, alkaline phosphatase, gamma glutamyl transferase, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatograph, magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatograph, as well as a CT scan. So you may just pick any four that are very important here. Now, the reason why she can't really see very well is if she's had this for quite some time, remember that the fat is not going to be emulsified. So therefore, Fat-soluble vitamins are not going to be absorbed. So that's your vitamin A, D, E, and K. So there's going to be a vitamin A deficiency. Moving on to station 7. A 56-year-old patient presents to the clinic with a three-month history of anterior neck swelling with normal thyroid function test. What is the likely diagnosis? Mention four processes involved in the synthesis of thyroid hormones. Mention any three investigations that can be done in this patient. After surgery, she is noted to be unable to sing at high pitch. What structure is likely to be damaged? I really love these type of OSCE stations that actually test the information, especially this one that was set in surgery, because it really tests your science. It really tests your basic science and your knowledge and how to apply the principles and not just memorizing mere facts and figures in surgery. And I think this is a good way of assessing students. So here comes the answer. So this is most likely a euthyroid goiter. Well, the reason why I'm saying euthyroid is because this person had a normal thyroid function test. So if you, if you just say goiter, I think that would warrant you a mark because it's a, a single mark over there. Then the four processes are going to be including things like iodination or iod, iodine trapping rather, not iodination, iodine trapping. Then you have oxidation. Then you have iodination, which can also be referred to as organification. Then you have coupling. Those are the four predominant steps that are pretty much used. I don't know how this was a typo here. That are pretty much used in the synthesis of, iod of thyroid hormones. Then, of course, mention any three investigations that can be carried out in this patient. So an ultrasound of the thyroid, a uh, lateral neck x-ray, and even a chest x-ray. And after surgery, you notice that there's injury to the a structure that, that leads her not to be able to sing at high pitch. So obviously, there may have been injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerves that may supply the vocal cords. Or that do supply the vocal cords, not may supply the vocal cords. Then... Station 8. A patient was referred to the orthopedic unit for further management of a three-month history of knee swelling associated with noticeable unintentional weight loss. What two signs are being shown in the x-ray displayed? What is the likely diagnosis? Mention at least four risk factors associated with this condition. What single most important investigation should be done in this patient? So you may pause the video, read the question, scream your answer at your screen, and here comes the answer. So of course, this is a sunburst appearance. This right here is a cord man's triangle. And these, this is obviously seen in a condition that's known as osteosarcoma. Because I, I'm saying this because the three-month history of the swelling of the knee, the unintentional weight loss, which are the constitutional symptoms, and of course, these features that you see on the x-ray, the sunburst appearance, as well as the cord man's triangle. So risk factors include age. It's very common between ages 10 to 30. The height, it's very common in tall individuals. The gender, it's more common in males than it is in females. The race, it's common in African-Americans, Hispanics, and Latinos, and a presence of other bone pathologies like Paget's disease of the bone, as well as fibrous dysplasia. Then the single most important investigation you should do is a biopsy for histology. Coming to station nine, which will cause a lot of controversy here, but a lot of you probably are going to miss this. If you haven't read the chapter in my surgery book, you obviously may miss this. A 10 kg child presents to the accident and emergency department with burn wounds to two thirds 
of the head and neck, one sixth of the anterior part of the trunk, and the whole right upper limb. Using the Wallace rule of nines, estimate the total brain surface area. What is the indication for admission in this patient? Calculate the total amounts of deficit fluid to be given in 24 hours using Parkland's formula. And how is the fluid given? Why do burns burn wounds on the face heal quickly? Mention one complication associated with facial burn wounds apart from inhalational burns. Quite straightforward question, and they even added a picture of, of, of the child that was burnt here. Quite straightforward question, and I know some of you are going to be arguing and screaming at your screen that we don't use the rule of nines in children, it's an adult. So what we use in children is the rule of sevens. Then you calculate using the rule of sevens, and that's how you actually get the question wrong. And notice how part A is very dependent on part C, it's very dependent on, on pretty much part B. So if you get this wrong, then it's like a domino effect. Such questions have what is known as a domino effect. One question leads to the other question, and if you get one of them wrong, almost the entire question is wrong. So before I actually tell you the answer, let me just explain. So this is how we use the rule of nines in children. We assess two nines to the head, because children have a huge head, which has a huge surface area compared to the rest of the body, and a smaller body. So you give two nines, as opposed to giving one nine, you give two nines to the head, and nine for each, for each upper limb, nine nine in front, nine nine at the back, and three nines for all the lower limbs. So it means that if you count these nines, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So this gives you 99%, then the perineum is going to be 1%. So keep this in mind. So now what's the total body surface area? So two thirds of the face, the face consists of two nines. So 18% multiplied by two, so 18 divided by three, that's six multiplied by two, that's 12. Then one over six multiplied by 18, that's going to be 3, so 12 plus 3, that's 15, plus 9, that gives us 24%. So this child is a 24%. Reason why we admit this child is because the burns on the face plus the uh, severe burns, so more than 10% of the surface area has been burnt. How we calculate this using the Parkland formula? Remember, 4 mils multiplied by the burn surface area multiplied by the weight. So 4 multiplied by 24 multiplied by 10, that gives us 960 mils. We give this in 24 hours. Now this is going to be given as follows. The, the half of it is given in the first eight hours. And then the other half is given in 16 hours from the time the child was burnt. Not from the time they report to the hospital, from the time the child was burnt. The reason why burns on the face heal very quickly, it's because of a high vascularity. There are a lot of blood vessels at the face. Then of course, burns on the back heal very slowly because the, of poor vascularity and the position. Then, of course, one complication could be microstomia and even nectropion. Station 10, and indeed the last station, a 40-year-old male with on and off history of epigastric pain and dyspepsia presents to casualty with generalized tenderness of the abdomen. As you take the history, he shows you the investigation shown in the picture. What investigation was done and what is the pathology? Mention three risk factors associated with this disease. What complication has occurred? What single investigation should be done to confirm the suspected complication? And what will it show? What two other complications might arise from the initial pathology? So I want you to actually think about this question and pause and actually contemplate. This is the investigation that is shown here. You may pause the video at this moment and here comes the answer. So this is obviously a gastroduodenoscopy. So I, a reason why I didn't want to just limit it to a gastroscopy is because sometimes we do visualize these ulcers in the, in the duodenum, but this is most likely in the stomach because as you can see, these foldings, the, the rugae that we can actually see in the stomach. But if you were to say gastroscopy, then it, you may get an, a mark. You may say gastroduodenoscopy, you may get a mark. Then this is of course showing an ulcer. As you can see, this is an ulcer here. So risk factors include prolonged NSAID use, a chronic alcoholism and smoking, as well as chronic corticosteroid use. And the complication that has occurred is perforation that has led to peritonitis. So this, because this person has generalized tenderness, they have uh, of the abdomen and a history of this ulcers. 
How do you confirm that there is perforation? It's very, very simple. Just get an erect PA chest X-ray. So an erect posterior anterior chest X-ray. You're going to see air under the right side of the diaphragm or a double diaphragm sign. Then you know that they, this person most likely has air under the diaphragm and there's perforation. Two complications that may arise, it, it may transform into a malignancy, so it may become a carcinoma. And you may also have pancreatitis, especially with the posterior wall ulcers, which may actually extend to the pancreas and cause a pancreatitis. Here's our question for the day, and I want you to comment below. So a 45-year-old patient presents to the general surgical clinic with an ulcer on the leg as shown in the picture. Mention two differential diagnoses. What three questions would you ask in the history? What three investigations would you do? I'm very eager to find out who gets this today. I will pin the comment as usual. If you do get the question correct and I am satisfied with your answer, I will pin your comment. So please tell me and let me know what you think this is. Thank you for spending your time to listen to this episode of The Bazooka. If you enjoyed, consider subscribing. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu to Zambia and beyond. Until next time, bye-bye.